week, uh, moving into launch, I was talking to my friend Garrett Rayburn, and we, we were writing this message together, and, and uh, we both uh, had gone to D.C., Washington, D.C., separately. It was the first time I had ever been there was in the eighth grade. The first time I ever got on an airplane was an eighth grade trip to Washington, D.C., and then I went back recently for a, uh, a conference there. And uh, Garrett and I were talking about a real similar experience that we had. And so when you go to D.C., what stands out to you is all these huge buildings, these huge memorials and monuments and all these sorts of things. And so you see the White House is just a huge structure. You see the Supreme Court, this big pillars, enormous, ornate structure. I mean, even the Smithsonian Museum is just kind of the similar architecture. You see the Washington Monument, this enormous stone structure. You see the Lincoln Memorial, this enormous stone statue. But what stood out to both he and I were not those huge, grand statues, monuments, memorials. What stood out to Garrett and I, the same thing that we, we were talking about, were these little bitty, tiny monuments. In fact, fields, miles of little, tiny monuments in Arlington Cemetery. These were guys who had given their life for a mission. And I don't know if you ever thought about this before, but the mission was not their own. The mission was something that someone else had asked them to do. And as they fulfilled that mission, it cost them everything. And I think this is so different to the mission and the message and the purpose that you're fed in media and in songs. As we move through a series called Lyrics and Lies, we're talking about the messages of songs. That one we just heard by Iggy is this idea that you're so fancy, right? It's all about you. You get yours, get your money, get your paper, she says. And, and what's funny is that's not unique to that song at all. In fact, as I just looked, I, I've spent the last several weeks looking at the top 100 songs of 2014 and 2013. And as I scrubbed 200 songs, I saw a very, very common theme. It's this self-actualization. You find your purpose within you, which is to get yours and to build your kingdom. And it drives us towards this narcissistic focus. And we, we can look, I mean, I'll give you a couple samples real quick, like um, Kanye West, Good Life, right? L like, I think we have a sound sample of it. I go for mine, I get to shine, so, oh, okay, you guys don't listen, it's not Christian, I get it. Uh, that's cool. No, I, I respect that. Uh, Katy Perry, Roar, right? I think we've got a sample. Self-actualization, I stood for nothing, but now I'm going to stand for everything. You can't hold me down. I'm going to get up. I'm going to get mine. It's the same message, same thing as Iggy, right? We don't need to play it. You just heard it, this idea of fancy. It's the same message over and over and over. I got to shine. I get mine. Got my nose to the grind and a girl with a nice behind, right? And, and then every day after day after day, I hit rewind and do it all over again. It's this message. It's this message. Get laid, get paid, and try to upgrade over and over and over again. This is what you're fed. Hey, you, get laid, get paid, and try to climb that ladder, try to upgrade, try to get something better, try to move on to another season. Doesn't that fly in the face of this message in Scripture that there's a, mess, there's a mission for you? I think about 2 Timothy 2, verses 3 and 4. Join me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. That's so different than Kanye's message. Pursue comfort. And Jesus says, no, pursue your mission. Like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. I think we're so obsessed with finding our purpose and knowing our mission 
Like it's like our whole life, we've been on this track, we've been cruising. You know, it starts in kindergarten to first grade, and first grade to second grade, second grade to third grade. You get to high school, and then you move to college, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, maybe grad school. And then all of a sudden, the train comes off the tracks, and you're like, okay, what's my purpose? What do I do? What's my mission? Where do I go? i got to find meaning. I think that's what so many of us tonight were searching for is, where, where can I find meaning? Where can I find my place in this world? Where can I unleash the gifts that God has entrusted to me and find my mission, what's my calling? What am I going to do? And I don't think we want an answer to the question as much as we do self-discovery, this journey where we're taking disc tests and strength finders and am I an otter, a beaver, a golden retriever, a lion? Like what, what, am, I, what am I so I can find out what I'm supposed to do, right? Myers-Briggs. So tonight I want to talk about living your mission specifically move through how you get your mission, what is your mission, and how you accomplish your mission. When I moved into this ministry, the Porsche, that, that was my dream. In fact, the first thing I wanted to do was to change the name to The Mission, from The Porch to The Mission, because I, I just had this this idea that young adults from all over city, like the rich young rulers of Dallas, would come into this place and we would hand them military fatigues and a weapon and say, hey, now these are your marching orders. Now go and die for this mission. And, and it's a metaphor, not literally fatigues and weapons or whatnot, but you are soldiers that you would march through this city and change this city. And we didn't change the name because the porch, I, I found the same metaphor in the porch that you can sit on the front porch and you can see the needs of the city and meet the needs of the city, that this is our mission. And the Bible gives you a mission. If you're here and you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you need to look no longer for your mission. It tells you as plain as day why you were created. To set this up, I'm going to be in John chapter 17. The disciples are realizing who Jesus is. Uh, they they're, they, they kind of like, hey, there's something real special about you, Christ. Like you seem to know things that only God can know. You must be God. You must be God's son. And so Jesus moves from talking to them, then from, from talking to them to talking to God about them. And so you're going to get to, could you imagine getting to eavesdrop on one of Jesus' prayers? getting to hear what Jesus would pray for. This is one of the most profound prayers uh, of Christ in the scripture. You're gonna get to eavesdrop on it. It's been documented so that you can listen to it. And so he says this in John 16, verse 33. He says, I told you these things so that you may have peace because in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. See, when Kanye calls you to mission, he says, hey, come live the good life. Come and get comfortable over here. Get yours, it's time to shine. When Jesus calls you to mission, he says, come and die. He says, the world's going to hate you. It's going to be hard. It's real interesting, the contrast there. Come and go to war with me. For no soldier serving his master gets entangled in the civilian affairs. And then he begins to pray for them. Verse 17, verse 1, chapter 17, verse 1. After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. You see that? Finishing the work you, Father, gave me to do, Jesus says. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. It says that Jesus received his mission from God. It says, I'm finishing the work that you gave me to do. Can you, do you guys understand this? Jesus the most powerful man that has ever walked the face of the planet only did what he was told. That's not really ambitious, is it? The most polarizing character in the history of the world, the most infamous character, notorious character, famous character, most well-known person ever to live, only did what he was told. There's something that we can learn from that. He says, Father, I've, I've done everything I am finishing the work you gave me to do. This is the most influential man in the history of the world. And he says, 
I only do what you said. Can you imagine this conversation with him? Hey, Jesus, what are your goals in life? Whatever my father wants me to do. Okay, Jesus, well, well, what is your agenda? My agenda is the Father's agenda. Okay, Jesus, well, what is your plan? My plan is whatever the plan that the Father entrusts to me is. That's what I'm here to do. I'm here to carry out a mission that I didn't try to create. It was given to me. That's my first point this evening, that your mission is received, not created. Some of you are trying to create your mission. You're looking at your gifts and your strengths and, and who you are and where you are, and you're like, okay, now what is my purpose and how can I create it? How can I manufacture it? But missions when you go on an assignment, it always comes from a commanding officer where they sit you down and say, hey, this is why you're here. This is what I want you to do. And the Christian mission is no different. It's not created. It is entrusted to you. Do you guys believe that you were created by God? Head nods. Hopefully, if you're a Christ follower, I believe God is sovereign. He created me, formed me in your, my mother's womb, knows how many hairs are on my head. Scripture says. Can you think, like almost everything that is strategically made is made for a purpose. Like you don't strategically create something and then figure out its purpose, do you? I mean, it's not like they made the iPhone and they say, okay, now let's figure out what it can do, you know? <laughs> you know, I, I, I think it could work as a hammer. No, no, it was made for a purpose. Oh, the, it makes calls, it sends emails, it was made for a specific purpose. You are no different. You're not trying to create your purpose. Your purpose has already been given to you. Your mission has already been entrusted to you. You need to read it and obey it. It's not something you're creating. It is something that you receive from your master. And so Jesus' mission was given to him. But is it true for his followers? I want to I make an argument that it is. It absolutely has been given to us as well. It's been given to you as well. We see this in Acts 20, verse 24. Paul says that his mission was given to him. He says, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Uh, I, I'm trying to carry out the task that has been given me. My mission has been given to me. He's just doing what God has told him to do. And this is all throughout the scriptures, right? So the, the expansion of the early church was that was, there wasn't like this, hey, everybody gather around, let's get a whiteboard and let's kind of draw out where we're going to do and come up with a strategy. No, it was as simple as Paul saying, hey, God, what would you have me do? Okay, guys, this is what we're going to do. Okay, God, what would you have me do? Okay, guys, this is what we're going to do. He is a soldier carrying out his mission given to him by his commanding officer. And this is true for the prophets as well. The prophet Isaiah says, hey, I'm carrying out the very things the Lord has given to me. I'm giving to the people the very word that the Lord has entrusted to me. This is true, did you know, for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, who is God, says, I don't say anything that the Father hasn't told me to say. I don't ask you to do anything. The Holy Spirit, who is God, is only doing what God has told him to do. That comes from John chapter 16, verse 13. So you know I'm not just making that up. Jesus, who was God, is only relaying instruction from God the Father. That's John 14, 10. He says, I'm only telling you what the Father has told me to do. I'm only doing the very things the Father has commanded me to do. And so in summaries, the apostles, the prophets, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus were carrying out God's mission for them, not looking for their own mission. And we are no different. If you're not looking for your own mission, you're carrying out the mission that God has for you. We love to know that God has plans for us. Okay? Jeremiah 29, 11, anyone? We love verses like this. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you. We love to know that God has plans for us. We memorize things like Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths or make your path straight. We love knowing that God has a plan for us. We love seeing that in scripture, verses like Ephesians 2.10, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God has prepared in advance for us to do. God has plans for me. We love to know what God, that God has plans for us. We just don't like it when we see what they are. Okay? We love to know that he has plans, but when we see what those plans are, we're like, what else? Where's the husband in there? Where's the wife? picket fence in there where's the where's the good life in there God 
where is it? Like, give me, okay, yeah, I know I'm supposed to do that, but what else am I supposed to do? What else do you have for me to do? I see this all the time in young adults. I, I remember specifically one interview that I had with a guy. It was a, he was interviewing on staff here at Watermark, and uh, the dude was gifted. And I had heard about him. I'd heard he was coming from this church where he had been for uh, over a year, and and he pulls up, he's impressive looking, like just to tell you, because I'm, you know, you can't, like it's hard to meet with someone and not kind of grab the context clues as possibly as you can. And, and the dude pulls up in this black BMW and he gets out and he's real impressive looking. And I'm like, oh, okay, this dude's worldly. He doesn't, you know, he probably doesn't know Jesus, which is sin on my part, I admit. I'm just being transparent. That's what I thought. And I sit down with him and uh, it's me and Blake and we're interviewing the dude. And, and uh, Blake says, uh, do you know uh, Philippians 4, 5? And uh, he, he's like, he kind of pauses, and Blake goes, a lot of people know Philippians 4, 6, not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, present your request to God. Uh, and the peace of God, which uh, transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. He goes, but you know Philippians 4, 5. And the guy stops for a second, and he's like saying stuff under his breath. And I'm like, hey, what are you, what are you, you speaking in tongues right now, bro? What are, you, <laughs> what are you doing? And he goes, well, I, I know Philippians. I'm just trying to get to chapter 4, verse 5. I was like, what do you mean you know Philippians? <laughs> oh, you, you memorize Philippians? <laughs> like the whole, whole book? <laughs> and he's like, yeah. And I'm like, oh, wow, okay. And so what, what, what happened, it began, became unbelievably apparent that this guy was not just physically impressive, but that his, his heart was impressive too, that he really, really loved the Lord. Not just his mind was impressive, and mind was impressive, he was really smart, but he really loved the Lord too. And so it, it just didn't make sense to me. His output didn't seem to match the input. Like his, as gifted as he was, it didn't see, I mean, here's what I'm thinking. Like this dude should have the largest young adult ministry in the world. Like he's really impressive guy, but, but what's going on? Like there's not something there. And as I got to spend time with him, I realized he was so driven that he kept driving past his mission kept looking for it he kept saying okay what's my mission what am I supposed to do and go and conquer and he never stopped and he said okay how do I be faithful right here and, and so Todd picked up on that as well our senior pastor and just said hey you need to be faithful right where you are you're not looking for your mission your mission has already been given to you your mission is right in front of you it, it, you be faithful right where you are before you try to go climb and conquer another mountain. How faithful are you being right where you are? And so you're like, all right, JP, what is God's mission for me? If, if he has really outlined my mission, what is it? Back in the verse, verse 7, John 17. Now they know that everything you have given me, Jesus is praying to God, the Father, have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them, talking about the disciples. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. Now, why would Jesus say, I'm not praying for the world? This is his opportunity. Lord, I pray for the world. Would you heal the world? God, I pray for world peace. Lord, would you, uh, would you just kind of explode the gospel over the world? I pray that everyone would believe in me right now. He says, I'm not praying for the world because they're in the world i pray for them that they would carry my carry out my mission in the world if they carry out my mission in the world i don't need to pray for the world i pray for them to carry out my mission in the world i have given them your word and the world this is verse 14 and the world has hated them for they are not of the world any more than i am of the world Kanye says, be of the world. Jesus says, you are not of the world. If you are mine, you're not of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one in the world. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. You have been sent now. You have a mission. You've been sent on mission into the world. And so what is our mission? It's the same thing. He says, just as you have sent me, I'm sending them to do this. The very same mission you sent me to do, which is in verse 4 and 6, says Jesus was sent to glorify the Father by revealing him to those he has chosen out of the world. 
Jesus was sent to bring God glory by revealing God the Father to those who are elect in the world. What I mean by that, those who God has chosen out of the world, your mission is to reveal God the Father to them. That is why you are alive. You do not want to get to the end of this race and realize that you have missed your mission. The reason God has left you here is so that you would carry out that mission and reveal God to those he has chosen out of this world. How do I know who he's chosen out of this world? I guess you got to reveal him to everyone, and he gets to choose, right? I don't know how you know he's chosen out of the world. The ones that listen to your message, what if they don't listen? They're not going to listen. What if they hate me? They're going to hate you. He's made that abundantly clear. But that's your mission. You're on mission carrying that message forward that others would know God and trust in him. To say it as plainly as I can, your mission is to be and make disciples. My second point this evening, your mission is to be and make disciples. This is your mission. This is the biggest calling on your life, to be and make disciples. I can make it no more. What is a disciple? A follower of Jesus. To be a follower of Jesus and to make a follower of Jesus. Guys, this is why you're alive. Now, you spend more time doing this than you do trying to have fun. You spend more time doing this than looking for a significant other. You spend more time doing this than idolizing an apartment or a car or a house or anything else. More time doing this than trying to get promoted. More time doing this than working. More time doing this than anything else you could possibly do. The calling on your life is to be and make followers of Jesus Christ. Kanye says, live your life for you. Jesus says, live your life for everyone around you so that they might know the Father. This is life on mission. And so we learn a lot from what Jesus prays, but we also learn a lot from what Jesus doesn't pray. He doesn't say, God, thank you for this day. Help us to have a good week. Father, I pray that you would help you know, Peter get that promotion. Father, I pray that you would help them to be true to themselves and follow their hearts and get a good job and have a good life. Father, I pray that you would help them accomplish their dreams. Everything they want, would you give it to them, God? Help them to get married and have two kids and a German shepherd and a white picket fence. He prays, Father, I'm sending them to do what you have sent me to do. To show a world who, you will, who will hate them who you are. So that the elect might come to know you. I, I used to, when I became a follower of Jesus Christ, and I realized that there was this thing called heaven, and I was going to get to go there. And as I learned about how amazing it was, I began to pray to die. I know that's weird. But every night, I would just say, Lord, pray I don't wake up. Take me home. And I wasn't depressed. Like, life was good. But I just saw that heaven was amazing. And, and I would talk to people, and they were like, they would say things like this. They would say, oh, no, there's just things I want to experience here. I'm like, like what? Like it's heaven. Like, well, I, I want to get married or I want to walk my kids down the aisle. I want to see places of the world. Mm. None of those reasons are why you want to stay here. If that was it, you would want to die and go to heaven. God has left you here so that you would know him and make him known. That's it. That, that's why I see the sin in my prayer before, my, my prayer to die. No, no, God's not done with me. He'll take me when he's done with me until then, like I'm here because God hasn't answered that prayer so that I can tell you your mission is to be and make disciples. This is how you're going to change the world. By following Jesus and making followers of Jesus, there is no other plan. There is nothing else that you can do with your life of any eternal significance than to follow Christ and have others follow Christ. Everything else you do is eternally wasteful. Okay, everything else you do. Now, I'm not saying that God cannot be glorified or delight in you as you have fun. That's fine. But you have fun even as you have fun, you have fun on mission. That you would be and make followers of Jesus Christ. And you cannot accomplish that mission unless you are investing into the lives of others. You cannot do it. Let me say that again. You cannot carry out the calling on your life unless you are investing into the lives of others. And the good news is you don't have to take Myers-Briggs or DISC or Strength Finder or know if you're an Otter, Beaver, Lion, 
or a golden retriever or anything else. You're a follower of Jesus Christ, and the mission is right in front of you that you would be and make followers of him. And you say, man, you pulled that from his prayer. That's not real clear in his prayer. Like, are we sure that's my mission? Let me give it to you. It's Matthew 28, verse 18. Then Jesus came to them and said, this is the resurrected Christ. One of his last words, you're choosing your words carefully when you're about to leave. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus says, all authority has been given to me. And so I'm commanding you as my soldiers to go and make disciples everywhere you go in all of the land. And because they carried out that mission, we get to follow Christ. And in your scripture, that's called the great co-mission because Jesus says, I will go with you always. I will be with you. It's you and Jesus at mission together. I want to I be with Jesus. If you want to be with Jesus, you carry out his work and it says he's with you. We all want, hey, I want Jesus. I want the Jesus is with me always to the very end of the age. Don't forget the first part. Go and make disciples. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Man, like just to be totally transparent with you, uh, I want to be cool, okay? I want you to think I'm cool. I want to dress cool, and I just want to appear to be cool, and I want to talk cool. And this has always been a desire of mine. As long as I was around people, I wanted to be cool and wanted to be perceived as cool. And then when I came into ministry, I pulled that desire with me. Still want to be cool, like even right now as I'm standing here. I want you to think this shirt's cool, okay? Even if you don't. <laughs> and I'm in Houston, and I'm, and I'm sharing there at Metro, and this guy picks me up from the airport every Thursday, and we get in his very uncool car. And I don't mean to hate if you're listening, but he's wearing some uncool clothes. <laughs> and he didn't talk cool. And, and as we were talking, I realized this, man, this guy's, main mission in life is to make disciples, make followers of Jesus Christ. And as I got to talk to other people, they said, oh man, Don picked you up from the airport? Yeah, yeah. Oh bro, that guy has had such an impact on my life. And I'm like, well you're a pastor now. I wasn't, a pa I wasn't even a Christian until I met Don. What? Yeah, he would just sit down with me. There were like 12 of us there and he would just teach us the Bible. And it dawned on me that, that dude's going to have a better eternity than I'm going to have. Not, not that it's about performance, but it is about discipleship. You're saved by grace. I know that. It's God's doing in spite of you. But it says you can store up treasures there forever and ever and ever. And that dude is storing up treasures. He's not distracted by Kanye's message or Iggy's message or Katy Perry's message. He is focused on Jesus' mes message, and therefore he is focused on Jesus' mis mission. And I was like, man, I, I want to be focused on Jesus' mission. See, a non-reproducing Christian, a Christian who does not reproduce themselves and others, is not a biblical Christian. You may not be a Christian. Like, that, that seems that when the Holy Spirit regenerates a heart, the Holy Spirit uses that person to continue to invest in others. And so you say, well, wait a minute, I don't know my Bible, well, that might be part one of your mission. Learn the Bible and teach the Bible. It can't get any more simpler, right? N know God and make him known, okay? Well, I don't know God. Okay, well, then let's work on that. Know God. Know God, you know, you, you become a Christian by trusting that Jesus Christ has died for your sins and that God raised him from the dead. And, and if you trust in that, that he paid the price for your sins, then you will be with God forever just as he is. He got what you deserve, you get what he deserves. And then he has this book, which is the Holy Scriptures, God breathed, it says, and you learn that. And there's eternal truths in there that you can apply to your life, but you also learn about God. And then you begin to teach that to others, just one verse at a time, one principle at a time. There's so many resources. There's never been more resources available to you than right now, today, 2014, that you would know God and make him known.
And so you're like, well, what, what is my mission to make disciples? Do what, Jesus? What am I supposed to do? Make disciples. It's not that simple, Jesus. It's that simple. Go and make disciples. Well, what if there's resistance, Jesus? There will be. And right now, you're the resistance. Go and make disciples. It's that simple. Go and make followers of Jesus Christ. Verse 20. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. This is Jesus praying for those who will believe in the message that the apostles or the disciples carried forward. Who is that? It's us. Sometimes people come up here afterwards and they want me to pray for them. And like other volunteers ask to offer to, I'll pray for you. And they're like, no, I want JP to pray for me. The, you know, and I'm like, man, I, and I'm encouraged by that. Like, I, I want to pray for you. But my prayers are just as powerful as any of these other pastors up here. Not any more powerful. But if you think so, this is God in the flesh, Jesus Christ praying for you. That you would know his message and you know that you being here tonight is evidence of God working through that prayer a couple thousand years ago. That you would be here. You are changing the world through the lives of young adults. And so my third point is that you cannot accomplish your mission alone. You cannot accomplish your mission alone. Individuality is the message of fancy and roar and good life. It's the message of the world. It's be your own person. Be your own person is an anti-biblical message. Be your own person is an anti-biblical message. Let me give it to you, verse 21. That all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Jesus wants us to belong to his body, the church, that we would be a part of this mission together. That a key part of our mission is doing it with other Christians. That we would leave here with our fatigues and not go our separate ways and not die alone, but die in our troops. That we would be in troops, that we would go through this world belonging to a body, accountable under the authority of elders at a specific place, yoked with other people, expressing our gifts through his body, through his mission called the church. It's not a building, it's a people. It's always been a people, it's never been a building, it is a people that you would leave here together and change Dallas and change the world together through his church. He says this. Here's an email I wrote to my team this week, and we just got back from launch. It must be something really special to train with a specific troop of soldiers. Every day you wake up and only to sit in the same huddle of people again. You eat together, you practice your skills together, you sharpen each other and uh, make each other better. Pretty soon, a part of your identity is, a, is really a shared identity of your troops. You become a piece of a bigger unit, a team of soldiers who share a common vision to be equipped to carry out a mission, a common mission, which is to destroy the enemy and honor the captain. I imagine in that sort of training you grow some pretty tight bonds when you shoot together and work out together and run together every day. I imagine some deep friendships are made. Then, however, a day will come that you would go to war together. War is when the training is tested. War is when you go without sleep. In war, you are constantly looking to survive. In war, your muscles are fatigued and your mind is tired and new battles keep coming your way. I imagine in war, the troop you fight with is that much more important. I imagine in times of war, those friendships grow to another level. A bond is formed out of shared memories and stories, told or untold, that will last forever. And then I just told them, hey, this weekend at launch retreat, we've been at war together. And when we return to Dallas, let's continue to be at war together. Because there's evil in Dallas. There's evil in Fort Worth. There's evil in the Metroplex. There's evil in the world. And God has left us here. He didn't save you and then call you home right then to be with him. He said, no, you're my plan A. There is no plan B. You are the way that I'm going to save the world. I'm going to work through you and share the gospel through you and build the church through you. And I need your attention. And if you listen to Kanye's message, you're going to be distracted and pursuing comfort and trying to die easy, living the good life. He said, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I've overcome the world. You've got to focus because I want to change the world through you. And I need you to get along so that you would be one unit. It says this, verse 22. 
I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I and them and you and me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you love me. The image is not just us fighting evil. The image is a powerful one of us gaining recruits, building our team, building our troops. When I was at launch, I was talking to this dude who was out there. He was an addict. He had his drugs with him. He said, I want to commit my life to Jesus. That which I was working against, the evil I was fighting, became part of my team, and our team got stronger. Girls, like I'm focused on my body, and I'm focused on boys. And I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to focus on Jesus. That which we were messaging against became a part of us and we got bigger and stronger. Guys stuck on themselves, narcissistic, ready to return to Dallas to get theirs. God grabbed a hold of their heart. They said, I want to join that mission. And we strengthened. Not long ago, I was talking, uh, I guess about a year and a half ago, I was talking with a young man who was addicted to getting high, you know, smoking weed. And, and, and having sex, and, and he was like, I want to follow Jesus, but I don't know how to give these things up. And God grabbed a ho hold of his heart. And now I meet with him every week, and he helps me write the very sermons you listen to. He informs them. And I'm about to do his wedding in a few months because God grabbed his heart and transformed his life that fast that he became a part of us, and we became stronger. Six years ago, there was this girl, she wrote me today, it just said, Thank you uh, for such an incredible, awesome weekend. It is because of God working through the porch six years ago that I was able to make that head-heart connection. I was able to hear and understand grace for the first time. And every year since, my heart has grown immeasurably more for him and his children. And I looked at that, and I'm like, that's the girl that's running our social media efforts. Like, she's, like, people are trusting Christ through her effort. Like, all of a sudden, that day six years ago, when she believed in God's grace, and that was enough for her, we got stronger, man. We got stronger. That guy, the BMW guy, remember him? He was like so driven and so focused and so impressive that he missed his mission. I watched that guy grow for the last 12 months. That dude just continued to say, I'm here to serve. I want to be faithful right where I'm at. That guy tonight, he has the largest young adult ministry in Fort Worth, Texas. That's Garrett Rayburn. And they're streaming right now. Fort Worth, we love you. Tonight is the first night they gathered over at the Ridgely Theater. And they're sitting there. They're listening to the same message that you're hearing right now. Our mission strengthened. When that guy said, I'm going to be faithful right where I'm at. And I'm going to have God use the gifts that, that he entrusted to me right where I'm at to be and to make disciples we got stronger man the mission of the porch has and always will be to make more fully devoted followers of Christ we didn't create that mission it was given to us that mission it is not self-centered but others focused and we must carry out that mission together and so in closing when we were at launch retreat, we were giving away prizes uh, the last day, and, and I was giving away a prize for whoever traveled there the farthest. And somebody raised their hand and said, I came from Arizona. I said, all right, anybody farther? Somebody else raised their hand. I, I came from Indianapolis. And I was like, wow, that's pretty good. And then I saw a bunch of people pointing to this girl in the fourth row, and I was like, what? You know, where'd you come from? And, I, and I, I, I realized who it was, and she said, I came from Kyrgyzstan. Winner, you know, it's like, okay. <laughs> Game over. And so I came back and I, I did a search in my email and I got this email April 9th, 2013. And dear JP, uh, you might receive tons of emails from all over Dallas and not only Dallas. I hope you have a minute to read my email. My name is Azeda and I'm a Christ follower from Kyrgyzstan. It is one of the ex-Soviet countries in Central Asia. I was blessed by one of your messages called Boy Meets Girl about two years ago during a tough time I was going through because of decisions I made. That was the first time I got to know about Watermark through my coworker in Afghanistan, who was a Watermark member. Since then, I have been listening to Todd Wagner and your messages through Watermark Media and shared with other friends to listen as well. 
God used your message to draw me closer to him and gave me a desire to run after Christ. You might not know, but your messages have been listened to across the ocean, even in Muslim countries like Kyrgyzstan. I thank God for putting his people in churches like Watermark to spread his word. Sincerely, Azeda. And so she rededicated her life to Christ when a friend uh, shared with her about, uh, you know, the porch and what God was doing here. She jumped on a plane. She flew here. Somebody came up to my office and said, hey, there's two girls from Kyrgyzstan down here. I was like, what are you guys doing? They were like, well, we just want to come and see the place that had such an impact on our lives. And, and so then they left, and now she's moved here, and she's enrolled in Dallas Theological Seminary. She moved a couple weeks ago, and she's continuing to grow in that message. And, and there's also guys in Sweden. There's guys in Australia. Uh, there's a group that gathers every Tuesday in Chicago. Uh, there's all of these people that are hearing this message, and I tell you that because could you imagine how powerful it would be if we could take this message to all over the world that people, young adults specifically, 20s and 30s something, could hear a message about Jesus from the scriptures relevant to their life stage in their 20s and 30s. Could you imagine how powerful that is? But when I posted on social media about the Fort Worth campus, I got a bunch of responses of, well, what about my city? What about Boston? What about Chicago, and what about Austin, and what about San Antonio, and, and so tonight we're launching a porch app, a live stream, you can live stream the shames, you can live stream the message, and so in one moment right now, okay, we have young adult ministries in Cairo, young adult ministries in Tokyo, young adult ministries in LA, young adult ministries in Chicago, okay, and so we're taking this message of Jesus Christ, and we're covering the world with it. We had... We had no idea when we came up with those shirts earlier this year that says 214 to the, to the world what God was going to do. I want to be abundantly clear with you. I don't care about fame. I'm sure there's something wicked in me that wants it to be transparent. But I don't do this so that I can sell a bunch of books. I hadn't written one, okay? <laughs> or, or, or so that David or JP or Todd Wagner can be famous. I want to give my life to making Jesus famous because as Jesus take root, takes root in the hearts of young adults, they're going to take that message and they're going to spread it. But do you know what they're saying about you? There's articles coming out every week. I read them. It says the collapse of evangel evangelicalism. The collapse of the church is what they're calling it. And you read it and you say, you know what? These millennials, these Gen Yers, they're so focused on themselves and their comforts that the church is dying. They have forgotten the commission. They've been listening to Kanye. And the church is dying. And I'm telling you, may it never be. Not on your generation. Not on your watch, man. You give your life to this mission. May you have a, a small monument one day, not even decorated, that says he, she gave her life for the mission. What else are you going to do? You think you're going to get up there and wish you had a higher paying job or a husband or kids? Do you think you're going to be sad that you never got to walk your little girl down the aisle up there? Absolutely. Up there, you'll be watching the game tape of all of the work that God did through you while you were here, carrying out his mission here. But don't be distracted by comfort. Focus on the commission of Jesus Christ, him saying, I will work through you. Okay, can I have your buy-in on that? Can I get a head nod? Like, hey, we're in on that. We're going to leave here. We're going to give our lives for this mission to be and to make disciples. I'm not, I'm not gonna worry anymore about my job or where I'm at or how uncomfortable I am or how small my bed is or whatever your worries are, okay? I got a small bed and I want a bigger one. <laughs> and so we have an ask of you. Would you help us spread the word about this app? Uh, we've invested a lot of time, it's free. It's in the app store right now. If you would um, raise awareness tonight through your social media, hashtag, um, Thank you, Justin Timberlake, for that. Hashtag <laughs> Porch App. Porch App. P-O-R-C-H-A-P-P -P is the hashtag. You can go in the App Store, go to the porch. It'll be the first one that pops up. You can click the box in the uh, top right-hand corner, and you can hit share. 
And you can grab the post, you can hit copy link, you can put it in email, you can put it in Twitter, you can put it in Facebook, you can put it on Instagram, wherever you want to put it in your Instagram profile. Whatever that is for you, will you help us tonight raise awareness and hashtag poor chap? If you see a tweet that has the hashtag poor chap, will you retweet it? And here's why we're doing this. Because we want the message of Jesus to spread throughout the world through the lives of young adults. We are changing the world through the lives of young adults. Surrender to God. Surrender to God. We are changing the world through the lives of young adults. That's what I want to give my life to. And that's what I want you to give your life to. Okay? Let me pray that we would. As we move to worship. Father, stir our hearts around the mission that you have for us. Father, thank you for Azeda and Simon and people all over the world who are starting young adult ministries in their living room and gathering people and saying, hey, let's sit around and, and watch how God might use us, how we might be moved towards mission. And Father, would you use us in those ways? I pray you start right here with those here. I pray you start with those in Fort Worth. And thank you for the gathering there. I pray you bless it. Thank you for Garrett and his leadership there and those that you've raised up to, to be around him. Father, I pray you would bless them. We love you, God. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.